Hi, I'm Joe Smith, Chief Medical and Science Officer of the Gary and Mary West Health Institute and Chairman of the Board of the Gary and Mary West Health Policy Center. In just a moment, you'll hear details about our new analysis estimating U.S. healthcare savings of $100 billion over the next 10 years with three policy proposals that ensure healthcare prices are available to key decision makers. The first proposal focuses on patients and families and requires all private health plans to provide personalized out-of-pocket expense information to their enrollees. The second focuses on physicians and their evolving role in helping patients and families understand and manage their own health care spending and involves providing prices to physicians through electronic health record systems when ordering treatments and tests. And the third option, and the one with the greatest potential savings, involves expanding state-based all-payer health claims databases, or APCDs. This initiative could save up to $55 billion by collecting and providing data and analysis tools that supply quality, efficiency, and cost information to policymakers, employers, providers, and patients, allowing each to make more informed decisions and providing pressure on high price providers to reduce or justify their prices. As a next step, we're excited to be working with the APCD Council to help states develop standardized reporting measures that would allow for a consistent, federated approach to data collection and analysis. Foundational work that will help enable our mission of making high-quality health care more accessible at a lower cost to all Americans. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the webcast and we'll continue to check our website for updates. Good morning. Thanks for coming this morning. I'm Shelley Leifer, the Chief Operating Officer of West Health. Unfortunately, our CEO, Nick Valeriani, could not be with us today, so I'm here to welcome you and to start our program, the West Health Idea Series, where we bring together thought leaders and stakeholders to open up the conversation on how we can make healthcare delivery more effective and less costly for all Americans. At West Health, our single aim is to lower healthcare costs while preserving quality and access for all patients. We believe that increased transparency is an indispensable part of that conversation. A truly efficient medical marketplace is one that not only promotes price transparency, but readily provides information on the capabilities and limitations of healthcare services. In other words, value must be part of the conversation. Today, you'll hear more about the issues as we unveil West Health's new study that estimates savings of $100 billion over the next 10 years. With new policies that ensure prices are available and accessible to key decision makers, including insurers, employers, and healthcare professionals. We'll first get an overview of the findings from Chapin White, the study's lead researcher, followed by a panel discussion and then audience Q&A. So thanks to everyone who is here this morning with us in the night studio at the museum and also to all of those who are viewing in on our webcast. Without further delay, I'd like to welcome our guest moderator for the event, Scott Hensley. Scott is a writer and editor for NPR's Shots blog. Before joining NPR, he was the founding editor of the Wall Street Journal's health blog. It's great to have you here today, Scott. Thanks, Shelley. And without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to you. Great. Thanks a lot. Good morning, everybody here and also online. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we'd like to get started with an overview of the report issued by West Health today by the lead author, Chapin White. He's a senior policy researcher at Rand Corporation, specializing in health economics. And I think uh, the report's quite provocative and has, unlike some uh, reports that come across my desk, some very specific recommendations that I think will form the backbone of what we talk about today. So Chapin, if you'd uh, take the podium and uh, help fill people in on what you found. Great. Thanks very much. For uh, having me, and uh, first, I'd like to say thanks to West Health. Uh, I feel really privileged to uh, have been part of a uh, project sponsored by uh, your group. And what I find really um, 
uh, intriguing and promising about uh, the way West does business is uh, there's a combination of reflection and action. And uh, I've, yeah, I'm a researcher, I'm an economist, uh, I've mostly been involved on the reflection side of things, but um, it's nice to uh, be involved with a group that's also tapping into the action side of the brain. The um, first thing I want to describe is the process that we went through to do this study. Uh, and we started out with the concept of doing something like what the Congressional Budget Office would do, scoring, uh, scoring a couple different proposals relating to price transparency. And that's something that I'm familiar with. I was at the Congressional Budget Office for several years. Um, but what uh, very quickly became apparent was that uh, it was going to be extremely important uh, not just to activate the economist side of our brain, but also to uh, get out and talk with uh, physicians and with uh, lawyers and with uh, health plan uh, professionals and with people from a range of uh, expertise to get a sense of how price transparency would uh, play out in the real world. And that, that basic uh, approach, uh, that basic methodology is something I learned from uh, Paul Ginsburg, who's sitting in the off, uh, audience and was uh, my boss at the Center for Studying Health System Change. Uh, and I, I think it's a, it's a powerful uh, combination uh, of approaches. So uh, we started uh, interviewing uh, pretty much every, every knowledgeable expert we could uh, get on the, on the phone, and a couple uh, things became apparent very quickly. Uh, one was that uh, the uh, discussion about price transparency usually focuses on patients and getting them information on uh, out-of-pocket costs, and that's, that's valuable, that's uh, clearly important. But uh, it was also obvious that there is a much broader range of people who are uh, involved in buying health care uh, and who need price information and who need different types of price information. And I guess what the impression I got was that buying health care is a, uh, a team sport and that uh, there are employers who are involved. Uh, mm -hmm. There are uh, the physician is obviously making crucial decisions. Uh, the state regulators are, are making decisions. Uh, and the health plans are deciding uh, how to set up their networks, how to design their benefits. Um, all of those people need to pull together to create a competitive marketplace that is moving in the direction of increased efficiency. Um, and so the, the report goes into some detail on the, the different types of price information that those different audiences need and what types of, um, uh, what types of actions they will take uh, depending on what information they get. Um, the other uh, takeaway that that uh, I I got from this project is that uh, price transparency has the potential to save uh, to save money. And in the report, we we uh, work through three examples of uh, policies that uh, that we estimate could save a uh, hundred billion dollars, roughly. Now, uh, the point uh, I would make two points about uh, about that figure. One is it's an unimaginably huge amount of money. Any, anybody would be more than thrilled to, to, uh, to work through a, a policy recommendation that, uh, that achieves that kind of savings. At the same time, we need to keep it in, in uh, the perspective of sp total spending on healthcare over the next 10 years, uh, which is, brace yourselves, $40 trillion. So $100 billion is an unimaginably huge amount of money. It's also I don't want to say a drop in the bucket, but it's, it's a small piece of what's going on. So price transparency, in my mind, is important not as an end in and of itself, but as a key step in the conversation about uh, what do we do about consolidation among health healthcare providers, what do we do about uh, tax policy that promotes uh, more expensive uh, healthcare, what do we do about scope of practice, uh, there, there's a huge range of uh, questions that are really at the heart of the healthcare spending problem. Tr price transparency can shine a light on those uh, issues, give us some of the vocabulary to talk through those issues and to talk about possible next steps. Uh, the big action is going to be in those next steps. So price transparency is just the beginning of uh, the conversation. So that, that's my takeaway from the study, and I'm, I'm thrilled with the, the uh, panelists that uh, are going to be talking today, and I'm going to go hear what you all have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Chapin. <laughs> if uh, 
buying health care is a team sport, so is talking about it. So we've got a team today with uh, three terrific panelists, so I think we'll each uh, play a different position and be able to uh, shine a, a different kind of perspective, give a different perspective on what's happening. So uh, immediately to my left is Josephine Porter, who is uh, at the University of New Hampshire and Deputy Director for the Institute for Health Policy and Practice. Uh, she's got some experience with uh, all-payer claims databases, which is part of the analysis, and I think she's going to give us some insights into how those actually have been working and maybe what some of the next steps would be. Uh, on the end, uh, we've got uh, David Lansky. I was thinking about which position, sort of maybe defensive end or offensive. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. So anyway, uh, he's the chief executive officer of the Pacific Business Group on Health. And as a result, he's tapped into what some of the biggest corporations and employers out west are thinking about when it comes to healthcare costs, transparency, and contracting, which I hope we're going to get to talk to a little bit in the time that we have. And then uh, free safety, <laughs> uh, Joe Smith from West Health, who um, has a real passion for this, and I hope that he'll uh, reveal that passion to us as we talk. Uh, but what, maybe what we could do now, uh, after the introductions, is uh, if you could talk a little bit about sort of what, what you bring to this, what's sort of your uh, specific interest, and maybe a highlight from the report that's relevant to the sort of world that you work in. And Josephine, maybe we could start with you, and then we'll go to David, and then we'll uh, We'll let Joe, uh, uh, I'll just mix up more sports metaphors, back clean up. So anyway, so uh, Josephine, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your experience and then uh, sort of what you uh, gleaned from the report. Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, one of the hats I wear as I, as I come to this panel today is as the co-chair of the All Payer Claims Database Council, or the APCD Council. And we've been working uh, as a learning network for states that have developed All Payer Claims Databases since about 2007. So we've seen um, our APCD movement, if you will, for uh, state-based All Payer Claims Databases move from about four in 2007 to about 14 now, with another six or eight um, potentially coming on board in the next year or so. So from the perspective of um, establishing all payer claims databases, and I think importantly for this discussion today, the really effective use of that data, um, our group uh, through the council and our partners with the states are really trying to find the best approaches to uh, make really good use of those data and to affect um, great tools that consumers can use and others can use to make these sorts of decisions. I think the paper itself um, made some great recommendations about the potential uses of APCDs and the impacts they can have. Um, and, and I think the, the future is how do we make those things real. For the, for the folks who aren't sure. familiar with them, could you explain for just a second sort of what one of these databases sure. is and sort of why your group thinks it's important? Yeah, absolutely. So all paraclaims databases in a sort of the, the most robust sense are legislatively mandated data collection systems that require that uh, carriers, typically with certain thresholds of covered lives in an individual state, um, are required to submit those data to a central organization at the state. What that allows for is for states to have a much better sense of the types of costs and utilization that are occurring in the healthcare system in settings that have not typically been available for states to understand. So states for a long time have had hospital discharge data sets that have allowed us to understand what's happening at the hospital setting, but we know that the majority of care doesn't happen there. Um, so all payer claims databases allow for some understanding of uh, what claims are being made for care that occurs outside of that hospital setting. And hospitalizations are part of the all payer claims databases also, but for the most part, um, the utility has come from understanding the broader perspective of care, cost, and utilization. Um, and so states are using the data in a number of ways to understand those kinds of care delivery system issues. Great. David, how do we lure you here onto this panel? Well, I represent uh, a Pacific Business Group on Health, large employers and purchasers of health care. Some of them are state government agencies. And actually, the California Exchange, the insurance exchange, is a member of ours. Oh. So it's uh, everyone who's involved in purchasing health care these days has the concerns about understanding what they're paying for care and what value they're getting for care. So our members have been working on this front for almost 20 years, back to the mid-90s and the early days of report cards on quality. And throughout that time, we haven't had data on the prices we're paying individual providers and the variation of those prices. And since about 2007, 2008, the same time frame Joe mentioned, we've had a small pockets of visibility into pricing. And what it shows is enormous variation. 
And typically the, the employee or the patient goes off to get care and they don't know what, they're, what door they're walking into and what the price tag will be till later. And then the employer often is paying a large share of that cost, as is the employee. So our members have been really concerned about getting data to the employee so they're making a good decision when they go to seek care and so that the employer themselves can choose arrangements and networks of providers that are likely to provide cost-effective care. So I thought this report was phenomenal in covering a number of policy levers that we should be pulling to make that possible, where we haven't done that in the last 10 years that we could. So obviously the APCD encouragement is important. For our members, one of the recommendations in here is to get rid of gag clauses and other limitations on the availability of price data. Right, right now that data is considered to be a contractual element between right. two parties, which means that the rest of us who are paying for the care and consuming the care can't see it. Right. And that's, it's very frustrating for our members to not have access to that information. Isn't that changing in some states? The, it is. Uh, California? Well, we've had a couple bills in the California legislature that have passed, but they've been very um, modest in their impact. There I are uh, other business practices that ultimately make it hard for the data to really surface to the employee and to the purchaser, and the report actually points that out. Okay. Well, maybe we'll come back to that. Sure. Joe? Yeah, so um, Joe Smith, I'm the Chief Medical and Science Officer at West Health. Um, started off life as a you know, geeky engineer, became a doc, cardiologist, cardiac electrophysiologist. And I think if you ask me about the passion for being here, I, so I've, I've been through the, um, much of the ecosystem of healthcare. So as, a, as an innovator and then as a practitioner, um, obviously you know, we all wind up being patients at some point or another. I've, uh, I've played leadership roles in uh, ven the vendor community in healthcare, medical technology uh, companies like uh, Guidant, Johnson & Johnson, Boston Scientific. Um, and now for the last four years, in more of a, um, uh, at times, a policy role. So I'm, the, I'm also the chairman of the board of our policy center in DC. Uh, and you know, there are some just undeniable facts that ought to get you riled up, right? So you know, we're, <laughs> we're spending $2.8 trillion on a healthcare enterprise, which is simultaneously the third leading cause of death in this country. Right, so we all know that, that heart disease, you know, I'm a cardiologist, you know, so root, I root for heart disease, it's the number one killer. Behind that is cancer. The next thing are the errors and mistakes we make in healthcare. So the notion that we're getting a bargain when we spend more than, you know, twice as much as the average of the OECD countries for an enterprise which looks at times more like killing fields than caring fields, you know, we, we need an opportunity to rationalize the investment at some sense. And so how do we do that when, you know, the, the traditional practice of, of healthcare has been one of paternalism where we as providers were actually viewing it as a virtue that we didn't know how much anything cost. We used to practice, you know, price, price blinded healthcare with the notion that that was somehow a benefit to each patient. And now as we, we have patients with greater and greater co-pays, more skin in the game, what used to be a virtue of practicing cost-blind or price-blind medicine has become a sin where you know, we, we can help people with their disease but make them homeless in the process. And so we need to rationalize this in an important way. And I think um, you know, when, when I talk about healthcare pricing transparency in a group, I often say, okay, so who here is, is in favor of obfuscation? Who here wants to keep this all a secret? And I don't get a lot of hands showing up, and, and maybe that's just because I might argue back, but I think it's arguing for the way we used to do it, not the way we have to do it. And so for that reason, really excited to be a part of an effort not just to talk about healthcare pricing transparency, um, and not just to, to argue for its benefits, but actually to go from what it ought to be to what it has to be by making it happen. One of the uh, first parts of the report, and I think uh, one of the, the ones that I, the average person might be able to grasp is the notion that there should be easier access for patients to price information. And in fact, there are uh, lots of insurers that are doing this, and then the Healthcare Cost Institute said yesterday that they're going to be doing more with Aetna, Humana, and uh, United Healthcare starting in 2015 to say, make it even bigger and more widely available. Uh, some of this stuff has been out there for a while, and the report calls on uh, this to become uh, essentially mandatory. How come it hasn't already had more effect? How come there hasn't been more traction with this pricing information that's already out there? 
So, Joe, you had a good story that you shared with us. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I think that um, the the idea that price transparency and the effective use of price transparency information is also a team sport, right? Like, okay. there's no single person that owns the responsibility of making effective use of price transparent data. Um, or information. So I was talking to the panelists earlier about um, the situation. My husband um, broke his toe. He was tripped over my son and um, and waited about a week, and it didn't get better. It got worse. So he went to his primary care physician. Um, his primary care physician wrote an X-ray order, um, and he, my husband, did the thing he's supposed to do in that situation. He called me and said, what am I supposed to do with my order now? Um, and I said, well, we are fortunate to have a, 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 a company that has a um, price transparency tool, and let's figure out where you should go get that x-ray, and not at the hospital that is associated with the provider that my husband went to. So he's a hospital-owned PCP, and naturally not because he's you know, an evil do doer, but because it's easiest for him to get that x-ray back from this hospital. And, um, and so we figured out that there was about a $200 differential between the hospital and this other freestanding facility. So naturally, he went to the freestanding facility, worked out great, um, had a referral to an orthopedic specialist for the toe, brought the x-ray with him. The orthopedic specialist said, okay, we're gonna do this again in two weeks, another x-ray. And my husband said, great, give me the order so I can go back to this place. And he said, why? And he said, well, my husband said, well, first of all, in my deductible period, it actually matters to me that I spend less. And, um, and you cost a lot. And the, the specialist said, I had no idea. And I really want to look into this, which is a great outcome, right? The specialist said, I, I want to know why this is. And I'm a little bit embarrassed, is what he said. Um, but the really interesting part of this is when he went to the desk to get the order, they didn't know how. They didn't know how to create an x-ray order that didn't go directly to the hospital. So my husband had to figure out how to get this x-ray order from the, from the physician's office to the freestanding facility. And he was the touch point in all of these circumstances. And that is a br big burden to put on an individual person. So it's not just the, oh, I need to understand where I can do this cheaper, but I also need to know how to traverse the system to figure out how to right. do something with that information. And that's why I say it's a team sport. Um, you know, we walked through a lot of steps that were a lot of, of work, quite honestly. Right. And we had a financial benefit to do that work, you know, probably per hour we got paid a lot to do that, you know, that kind of work. But it's not a natural thing for folks. And quite honestly, it's, it's not a natural conversation to have with the physician to say, I don't want to do what you just said. Right. I want to do something else. And so I do think that that one of the challenges is getting the information in an accurate way that actually reflects reality. Another challenge is giving people the tools so that that's easy to understand. And another challenge is giving them the tools to use it in an effective way. Right. And another step is getting the system to be able to be responsive to people who are ready to make those sorts of modifications to how they receive care. Got it. Joe Smith, do you think that can be done? Uh, well, I think, I think it has to be done. I think, uh, you know, when, when you think about um, empowering the individual patient, you realize how challenging that is, right? So as a doc, you sit there in your own office where, you know, kind of crazily, we ask the sick people to travel to the folks who are going to help them get better. We, we, burden, we burden the least able uh, to make the healthcare enterprise work. Um, and then, you know, we're all there with our, you know, our accoutrements of the profession, right? The white coat and the stethoscope, which is really more of an amulet at this point, than, um, than a, a tool for uh, the provision of healthcare. And so it is a rather tilted relationship, which is, which is why I think we, when we look across these healthcare pricing transparency tools that are open to like, I think as the report says, 98% of folks who have um, uh, insurance by these big plans, only 2% of folks actually use them because they find the impediments that, that are described right. just, just uh, not something they can overcome, Wh which actually is why I get more excited about how when you add that to, the, to one of the other findings that, that we looked at, which is more about um, giving, giving physicians an opportunity, a role, an obligation to participate in this process as well, I think you can then balance the playing field. Right. So, so one of the ideas uh, mentioned in the report is make uh, pricing information available 
at the time that the doctor might be making a decision to order a test or a procedure or refer someone for care, um, put that in the electronic uh, health record, uh, make that part of the ordering system. Um, there have been some experiments with that, um, but I think one of the things that we talked about is uh, putting that information in there is one thing, changing the medical culture so that doctors feel that they should do something with it might be even harder. What's your view on that? Yeah, well, I, I also want to give David a chance to, to chime in here on the, on the prior point. But to go down this road, I would say, um, you know, we've, the practice of healthcare in the United States and the physician's role in it is evolving. I think we're watching the democratization and decentralization of healthcare. You know, people are coming in with reams of paper that they've printed off the internet about, you know, what, what they believe they have and what they believe they need to have done. And now some of that includes uh, pricing information. I think we're moving also in our role. Um, we're not necessarily just a paternalistic uh, element who's helping a patient get better in terms of their health. We're, we're also now participating in a little bit of shared decision making around what's best for a patient in their preference sensitive conditions and more and more of the healthcare we provide, there are options and we need to have an, a, a full-on discussion, and it can't just be uh, blinded to a big part of it, which is uh, the cost of it. So I think we feel that obligation. Additionally, I think the ethical kind of makeup of what is a doc has manifestly changed. You know, the American College of Physicians redid its ethics manual in 2012 for the ethical obligation of docs, and it now finally includes this notion of parsimonious health care, where you have to think about all, all in what are we doing to patients. And so making them well and then burdening them with, with uh, you know, an economic scenario which will forever change their lives is not okay anymore. That's, you know, you have to actually think it all the way through. And I think docs will embrace this as, as, as soon as they have an understanding of the impact they have, as, as, as Joe was describing, um, but also they need the tools uh, for, for doing so. And I think we're currently relatively bereft of those tools for knowing, um, you know, what is it gonna, what is it gonna, uh, what are the economic impacts of this treatment path versus that on this patient, on my practice, on their copay? Um, how do I manage that for all of us together? Um, which I think is quite different than the social engineering concern that many have that docs are going to get involved in rationing. I don't, I don't think this is a rationing discussion at all. This is a rational discussion about how, how can I help a patient understand the economic implications of their alternatives. I think that's essential. David, yeah, did you I, want to I, jump in on yeah, that? Yeah, I want to pick up on the culture transformation theme. So I think what we're talking about here is part of a much bigger process that we're all part of, right. which is not only the medical community changing the way it sees its role and responsibilities, but all of us, employers, the payers, the government, the individual cons consumers, have to say that we all have a shared responsibility in having the information to make the system work sensibly. We're facing a number of very high cost decisions emerging on new technologies, new services, new drugs that are all gonna face tough trade-offs as a society. And we don't have information to make those judgments today. So whether it's an individual choosing Dr. A versus Dr. B or Hospital AB, or the society looking at a policy level, which the report talks about, at the costs of different approaches to care, we've got to create an open conversation about what things cost and how we respond to those costs. And we haven't done that. And each of the components of the system, of the team, have been reluctant to take on that responsibility right. and be candid about the trade-offs that are implied by those choices. So this is one of the important pieces of providing an infrastructure, a data source, to have that conversation. I mean, uh, Joe mentioned this notion that, you know, nobody's in favor of obfuscation, but the obfuscators may have an economic interest not to share information or to keep certain pieces of it close to their vests. How do you, uh, what's the information that, that purchasers and employers would like to have that they can't easily get now? Yeah, I think we're on the side of the table that is in favor of full transparency. Data liberation, of course. as Todd Park would say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we think that is going to drive a healthy, competitive marketplace when people can see what they're paying like they do for every other product and service in the society and let people compete on value, on quality and cost. We haven't talked yet today about quality information, right. but we think price transparency has to be mirrored by quality transparency so that all of us can make good choices about where we, where we want to seek care. So I, I was actually in a meeting with some health plan executives, one of whom said essentially blasphemy that we should just post our fee schedules and let's compete on that. And there are people who have dominant influence in a particular market who really, 
who believe they have negotiated the best prices and don't want those exposed to their competitors. And they go to great lengths in a business sense to prevent that information from being transparent. So we don't think that's the way forward. We think we have to provide that information to everyone to make good decisions. Is there any downside to more transparency? Is there, are yeah, there, there any unintended consequences sure. there, there that we will should be. talk there, we about? We had an experience in California where we made some efforts to post hospital uh, estimated prices. And uh, there was some perception that people then tried to negotiate up to what uh -huh. was possible in that market, what the other guy was getting paid. Why don't I get paid the same as someone else is getting paid? So there's going to be uh, trade-offs in the way the competitive market plays out. But I think more transparency will allow the consumers and purchasers to put more pressure on that marketplace. How important is something like a claims database of the type that Josephine has worked on? I, I think it's a critical well. piece of infrastructure for today. Mm -hmm. Right now, this is the only universal, quasi-universal set of data we have about who's getting paid what for doing what. And it has enough clinical information in it to give us some sense of the value that corresponds to the services that are being bought. So we're working very hard in California to build a multi-payer claims database that's voluntary. It doesn't have the state mandate Joe right. mentioned. But we're also working with a federation of a number of states to try to bring together best practices so that we can really accelerate this process around the country. Um, and there has to be a partnership with the federal government. As we've seen recently, Medicare has released a lot of very useful data, um, which has to be blended in with the commercial information to give us a full 360 picture of what's happening for cost of care and quality of care. So I think we're making strides in the right direction, but it's going slow. Yeah. Uh, sure. Let me say something about uh, all-payer claims database. When I first heard the term, I almost fell asleep. Uh, and so, it, you know, it's... it's nice. It, no, but, it, but, but it, it, you know, it's, it's lengthy and it sounds relatively dry and you say to yourself, another database, gee, um, boy, that's going to help. Um, but, but I think if you look at it, it through the lens of, um, for the moment, uh, let me give you an analogy of the weather, right? So um, I, I have three weather apps on my phone. Uh, I, I choose how I'm going to consume my weather. I live in San Diego and right now the dominant weather is it's raining fire, but, um, but I, I think I, the, the point is, all of the information that powers all of those apps really comes from one source. Um, it comes from NOAA, right? So everybody gets this data, repackages it, reformulates it, puts it in a different uh, user interface, and everyone finds a way to make use of it. And they consume it in a way that's now more attractive to them by virtue of a vibrant entrepreneurial community that has taken dry weather data and turned it into something pretty accessible and consumable and useful. And I think this is the same process we're going to go through in healthcare price transparency. We're going to look at federated models of APCDs where there's going to be lots of information about what you can get, where you can get it, by whom, paid for by whom, at what price, ultimately at what value. Uh, and that's not going to be something you're going to go to some government database to look up. No, in fact, you're going to get that information from a bunch of millennials who have created this very cool app that based on your zip code tells you where you can get your arm fixed at the cheapest possible price. And, and at the same time, the waiting room times are only 20 minutes. And so that's what we have to enable with the release of this information. I, I look across and I see Tony D'Agostino in the office and I know that Tony's the CEO of a little company. It's got nine millennials and a dog and a web server. Uh, and they're busy trying to figure out <laughs> how to take uh, pricing information and give it to docs in a way that at a moment of decision they can do what's best uh, for their patients given the pricing information. And it's that kind of energy that I think we're, is going to help us change this. And I mean, I, I would also add that I, I think the other value um, is, and we've talked a lot about price transparency at the consumer decision-making standpoint, and I think that's really important. But I think the conversation that needs to be had where people understand that variation that David talked about, we understand it because we've been in this game a long time, but the average folks still don't understand that there's that level of variation. And having information that looks across the board, not necessarily this is the decision I need to make right now, but man, I didn't realize that it really could cost this much different from here to here if I go get a knee. And that's kind of stupid, right? Like, so what am I going to do about that? And we were talking earlier about this sort of enragement that, that prompts action. And um, I think what we've seen in some of the analyses that we've done of the all payer claims database in New Hampshire, and we, when we've brought that out to our purchasers group and to others, it's, it's remembering that most people don't know what we know about the brokenness of the system and bringing that forward in a local way becomes very important. 
um, we have this, this analysis that we, w that we did that looked at um, the overall costs on an annual basis for people who um, get treated in the emergency department once, two to three times, four, t four, or four or more times. And we all know they're more expensive populations if you go to the ER more often, right? The ER is expensive, therefore when you add it up, it costs more. But the differential was around nine times. And so you start to have a conversation to say, what is it that's causing the, this to happen from a societal level, and what are the policy impl implications for that? So I think transparency is important from the decision-making standpoint and the, from the consumer, but it's also important in lots of other dimensions, and the paper calls that out as well, about the ability for us to think about the important policy implications of what is not working in the healthcare system, that we can talk about anecdotally that we say, of course we know this is true, but when you put the numbers behind it, it stimulates activities in ways that aren't stimulated if you don't have the dollar figures. David, yeah, did you have something to add there? Yeah, I think the critical thing that Joe emphasized is that getting the data is the first step. It's the critical, necessary first step. Nothing else happens until we have the data. But then the question is, how is it used, as Joe right. said? So for the example, for the employers, we're users of this data. And so some of our members, like both CalPERS and Safeway, have done reference pricing projects mm -hmm. where they say, exactly as Joe said, they look at the expenses they're incurring for something like a colonoscopy or a knee replacement surgery. And no matter what you look at, it, there's about an eight-fold range of cost between the lowest and the highest price provider in a place like California or anywhere. So in order to expo expose that range of pricing to the consumers, to the employees, and say, okay, we're, what's reasonable in this range of eight-fold okay. pricing is about here. We're going to provide- that's the reference price? That's the reference price. We're going to provide the normal good coverage we offer you up to that price. But after that, it's not reasonable. It's, not, it's really exploitative pricing. And we're going to expose that and make people upset and angry that they shouldn't be paying $100,000 for a knee replacement surgery. And they need to be encouraged to go to a place that's going to provide a more reasonable cost for that procedure. So that kind of transparency is applied to an actual service at the point of need, okay. rather than being an abstraction or a database in the sky. I had a question about sort of what is the definition of the product. So we've brought up some examples where it's discrete. So a broken arm, a knee replacement, uh, a banged up toe. Um, so much of the care that people receive now is for chronic conditions and something that sort of isn't just one episode of care, but it's something that goes on for a long time. How do you, how do you work up what the prices are for that and then make comparisons? Well, it's, it's going to be important that we can talk about the products. And there's a lot going on in the country right now about episodes of care, for example. What's a knee replacement episode? Mm -hmm. What's a cancer episode? Mm -hmm. And we have to define those things so that the consumer or the purchaser can look at something and have an apples to apples comparison between one service provider and another for that thing. And right now we have thousands and thousands of individual codes for individual services, which nobody can possibly make sense of individually. So we, as a, as a leadership group in society, the industry and the policy community, have to define some entities, some products, and give them a price tag that can be compared. But again, this data, uh, Liberacion, is the place to start that. We have to have the raw data available so we can then aggregate it up to create something that's comparable in the marketplace. Yeah, I want to play off your point. I think it's a good one. If, if you're getting a discrete service, you know, a, a prescription, uh, you know, a, a, a discrete operation, um, that can make sense in terms of doing comparison. But for chronic disease, you're really on a care path. You know, okay. You're led there by your, you know, your physician, your Sherpa, through the, the, the challenges of the management of your disease over time. And um, the, the notion of asking that system to tell me what that costs right now, you get blank stares. But the notion of collecting that information in, in these all-payer payer claims databases so that you can root through a trace of, you know, on average, when a 65-year-old when a patient with COPD and diabetes and asthma presents to this provider, this is what happens. And if they present over here, this is what happens. You now have an integrated experience of healthcare spending and outcome that's much more informative than knowing what an inhaler costs or knowing what the insulin costs. Much, much more informative. And that is how we spend money in, in, in the United States. 75% of healthcare spending is in chronic disease. And it's through different arcs described by different mm -hmm. Sherpas with their own right. local knowledge that determines that wide variation in cost without necessarily commensurate variation in outcome. Right. And, and I think in the pursuit of value, we need to understand that. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the other, as David said, there are a lot of commercial tools on the market that do this already, that, that cluster claims into episodes, and you can get that. I think one of the challenges that we see when you look at things sort of carrier by carrier is that an individual carrier may use one episode tool and another carrier may use a different episode tool. You know, one of the values that we see in the all-pair claims database is if you aggregate all of that data and you apply one tool, that it, allows, it allows for some consistency that okay. may not otherwise be available. Do you, do you have a sense, Josephine, from looking at some of these uh, uh, databases, sort of, it's, it's variation is going to always exist. So some variation is good because patients are different and mm -hmm. conditions are different. But some of the variation where you're talking about eight and nine times seems on its face to be kind of nutty. <laughs> uh, what, what's your experience or what you're thinking then about sort of how much of the variation is easy to say that's a problem, how much is like okay, and then what do you deal with the sort of gray in the middle? Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure that anybody has sort of figured out what part of that variation is um, is allowable or should be allowable. I mean, I think those plus or minuses change a little bit. I mean, if you think about where we are, um, we have a, almost a dichotomy in our state about from rural delivery of health care and I won't say urban because I'm in New Hampshire and this is DC, <laughs> right? But, but you know, less rural areas of um, of care, and I think there are challenges in those rural areas that cause some variation. And and you know, how do we quantify that? I'm not sure that um, that we totally know that. But I think to to add um, David's perspective of saying. If we know that, that eight times the cost adds no quality, then what is the value of that eight times the cost? And, I, and so I don't have a great answer for that, that quantifiable piece. I know that there's, you know, there have been a lot of studies about how much of our, our healthcare spending is waste and, and that variation is not okay and those sorts of things. But again, I think at the, at the end of the day, um, understanding what that level of variation is gets us closer to understanding what the acceptable level of variation Got is. And, and as David said, we're not at that first phase necessarily of having the broad understanding of the variation or allowable um, information out about what that variation is. And, uh, Dan yeah, or I, Joe? I, I wouldn't get trapped in the academic uh, discussion of you know, how much is exactly tolerable when you, know, you can focus for the near term on stuff which is obviously out of sync, right? So you know, if, it's, if, if it's doctor's offices that are a block apart, and they're getting exactly the same outcomes, and one is three times as much. Uh, you know, it doesn't take rocket science to figure out that there's there's a bargain to be had, and and you, one can figure out which place one ought to go to, right? So you you can make that choice. And so you know, if you if 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 you had to write that down in a complex equation and put boundaries around it, you might not get it. But there's a there's a practicality that makes sense. You know, I spent a decade of my life in an academic medical center. And I'll tell you that academic medical centers are not the first to embrace price transparency. Um, be, because you know, their infrastructures are not honed to be efficient. And they have multiple missions. And so um, as we move to a world where you've got um, you know, strong-arm negotiation over getting the best value for healthcare, the incremental value that an academic medical center provides in fixing a broken arm in the emergency room um, will be difficult to describe, particularly if it relates to stem cell research happening in a lab somewhere. And so I think, I think we have to understand that there are other missions being served by these healthcare dollars, and we have to decide how we're going to pay for them, but probably not through routine insurance mechanisms to pay for, the, the, for some of the off-axis elements that contribute to healthcare. Okay. Well, I agree. I think the, we have to discriminate where the money comes from. Creating the transparency lets us see where the money's coming from. If for the stem cell researcher at an academic facility, should the grocery store clerk on a very modest wage be giving up their wages to subsidize that research, that's a societal decision. It's not really fair right. to put that on the, on the clerk. So let's, let's let the transparency exist so that that individual can go seek out care where it's most appropriate for them at the most value for them. And then let's have a societal discussion about how to make sure other important things get paid for. We're going to throw the uh, session open to questions uh, from the audience in a minute, but I wanted to loop back to something that Chapin said, which sort of to contextualize a little bit of what we're talking about, that you know, the report contemplates that this, these uh, interventions that are described might save somewhere around $100 billion over 10 years, and, and then put that in the context of 
what we're actually going to spend on health care over those 10 years, and it's many trillions of dollars, um, is, is what, what, what should be the real goal here? Is it to save some money, or is it to do something else? Is it about changing the way people think about care and the way they make decisions about care? So let me take a start at it. I think I appreciate Chapin's uh, clarity about the potential impact of this and the scale of it. What's bigger than what the report describes is what we've talked about some today, the cultural transformation that is facilitated by the availability okay. of information. And if we had meaningful information on cost and price and meaningful information on outcomes and therefore value, that could drive a transformation in the healthcare system that we don't even understand or anticipate yet, where really we're seeing meaningful innovation, different ways of providing care in order to achieve value for both the consumer and the society as a whole. So this is a piece of facilitating something much bigger beyond the incremental gains that the report articulates. Yeah, so I'll, I'll loop back that part of that statement to part of uh, how we show up at work every day at West. And so if, if Gary West were here, he would say that you know, we, we owe it to be a catalyst to uh, transform the way uh, healthcare is delivered in this country. And I view price transparency as one of those catalysts. It by itself has a, a substantial impact, although in the scheme of things, it's not going to solve all the problems. It's not the magic bullet. But I think when we get to a point where prices are, are clearly transparent and there's such a variation and, and there's a provider or a provider network on the other side saying, well, our quality is so much better, you can say, really? Show me. <laughs> and right now, you know, what you hear is we can't really talk about value because while we can understand pricing, we can't really understand quality. Okay, so if people are making decisions on cost and you want them to choose your higher cost service because you say it's higher quality, that, it's going to force a conversation of, okay, well, here's what I mean by that quality and something that's going to make sense to the consumer. And so we will force a discussion about quality and that will be transformative. I think at the same time, if, if, we can, if it's okay to have a discussion with your providers about the cost of their services or the value they're providing, it starts to elevate the patient and, and achieves that democratization and decentralization and even demystification of healthcare. And it becomes a good and a service like everything else we pay for in our economy. And I, I think it starts to make it a much more rational discussion. And so I see it as a wedge to have there be um, a, an even playing field for in this space as we have in others. Yeah, I, yeah I, I would agree. I mean, I think that the, the reality is that the anecdotal um, experiences that we see would answer your question as sort of all of the above, right? Okay. So our goal should be to allow for um, some consumerism in healthcare that we think will, um, will have impact on costs and the, the anecdotes like the one of the broken toe. I mean, that saved $200 on an x-ray that we can't figure out why it would have been um, more in one place than the other in a rational way. So adding some of that rationality should allow for that consumer choice, which we think will have cost savings. And anecdotally, we see stories where that's true on a small scale. Yeah, I'd probably add one quick thing. I mean, so a careful study done estimated that by 2029, the average family of four um, will spend every nickel of its take-home pay in healthcare premiums and out-of-pocket costs if we're on the constant trajectory of rising healthcare expenditures. So we're not going there, right? That's not a place we're gonna land because we're not gonna be just a healthcare nation. Um, and so something's going to change and we can either be a part of that change uh, in driving tools and discussions and action like this or it will be changed centrally. Um, and, and that would be from here, from Washington. And I'm not sure that the blunt tools we typically use in Washington are sufficient to give us a healthcare system we would like in, the, in that eventuality. And so I think it's essential that we, we kind of own this problem and manage it as best we can. Great. All right, well, we've got a few minutes left for questions if uh, we've got some folks in the audience. Uh, I think there's a microphone coming your way uh, in the blue shirt. If you could just tell us who you are. Hi, I am Paul Plesik. I'm an innovator in residence at the, uh, at the MedStar Health uh, Institute for Innovation. And I want to pick up on the point that you just made and, 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 and segue into something, something David said. Uh, <clears throat> there is this, there is this uh, sort of underpinning notion in everything you're saying about how 
putting the data out there will allow the individual agents in the system to transform because because it'll be like a marketplace people people will do individual things on a local level versus the other approach which you just you just you just said Joe is a is a centralized control of the machine through a regulatory regulatory policy and we and we've had years and years of trying to regulate improvement in health uh, and healthcare and and we're coming onto an era where where we're opening it up more to be a complex adaptive system <clears throat> what what are your fears as panelists about this data liberation that 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 it might be used by policymakers and legislators and regulators to just put more regulation and more controls on the system that might not make it any better. Do you have a fear of that as we as we open this data up and and, and make it transparent? I, I think that's a legitimate fear to anticipate. I was actually thinking you were going to come out on the public safety side of that fear, which is that there will continue that the the risk is will lighten up on the, the regulatory structure that's been in place in, to protect people from various risks and abuses um, could be relaxed so much that we'll introduce new technologies, new approaches to medicine, licensing, scope of practice, all the things we think need to be rethought um, could be relaxed to the point where it jeopardizes people. Um, I'm not about that. I mean, good, all right. There has to be a minimum level of regulation yeah. to right. do those kinds of things. Uh, but I think the liberation of price information in order to stimulate uh, competition and, and innovation and efficiency uh, I don't foresee there being a regulatory risk there, but uh, I'll be interested if others do. Yeah, yeah so I, I'm, I'm actually, you know, there are, um, I think, um, healthcare reform has its advocates and its dissenters. I think um, there are elements, though, that I think uh, can, can be viewed as attractive from this perspective, that, you know, as we, as we create patient-centered medical homes and accountable care organizations, and we put uh, provider organizations at some economic risk for the care they deliver, it, it opens up a market for the entrepreneur to, to show uh, goods and services that, that are more cost-effective, more efficient, and can be adopted at a local level. We can have experimentation taking place at, um, at a state or a city or even a hospital or a provider-based level, and we can learn from that. You know, I, I note another member of the audience was with me at, a, at a, uh, two days of federal meetings here in D.C. around attributes of healthcare, And it was encouraging to see uh, the FDA offer some deregulatory uh, guidance in some spaces. And I think when you look at, when you look at that, when you see the enormity of the problem um, and the relative um, lethargy in, in government at the moment to come together to make big change, I think it, it provides an opportunity for the market to drive uh, some of the solution. Because I think the, the appetite for concerted movement in Washington right now over big issues is relatively modest. And I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Yeah. And, and I would just add, I mean, I think Joe made a good point that, you know, if we looked at some, if, when we look at some of the trajectories of what people say are the likely impacts or the po potential impacts of our healthcare spending trends, um, you know, the, I think there's there we have to do something mentality, and and my bigger fear is let's do something in the absence of the data without being informed of what we're actually seeing and having you know regulatory policy that's based on conjecture and what we believe to be true and not what we can show. Um, so in some ways, I I am more I would be more worried about that than than the other side of the coin. Fair enough. Uh, do we have another question? I am. One second. Now uh, Mike's coming your way. Just tell us who you are, please. Hi, I'm the CEO of Maven. We have two dogs. <laughs> um, Tony, Tony D'Agostino, and um, my question is, is on the second point about uh, requiring EHRs to have uh, uh, price transparency in them, we, our work has shown that duplicate tests um, and duplicate orders may have a bigger impact than even um, just showing transparency. And I was just wondering, was that covered in the report or did you guys think about that at all when you're looking at this work? Chapin is nodding no. Yeah. Okay. You guys have uh, your, well, some thoughts on that? Comment. I work on the Meaningful Use Committee for the, the, pro, the federal program. And uh, this issue that was proposed uh, in the report, which I was very attracted to, of moving meaningful use to, um, to incorporate, to integrate the, the cost information with the quality information, is really new to the meaningful use discussion at the federal level. And I, I think it's a very good idea. But the, to your point, the, the, the approach so far has been to say clinical decision support will permit us to flag potential redundant tests at the point of care and reduce the likelihood of them being referred again because of the access to the cumulative record. 
Um, but I, I think it falls short, frankly, in dealing with both the pricing and the cultural transformation we're talking about of helping the providers become more sensitive to their patients' experience of being exposed to high cost when they're making a decision. So both the clinical component that's already in meaningful use and the economic component that's not, I think, should be brought together. And, and Tony, to, to address that point, um, while not present in this work, um, a dominant theme that um, we've been working on for a couple years is having uh, EHR and medical device interoperability to drive just that outcome so that at no point will there be a provider who will be taking care of a patient and they won't be aware that, in fact, you know, there was a, a recent uh, uh, test that they might have been interested in that they're on the verge of repeating that is then available. And so I think it's only through you know, an interoperable, you know, smoothly, semantically interoperable space that all of that information will converge just when the doc is, is starting to use the most expensive piece of technology in healthcare, that being his pen, right? Uh, gentleman in the red tie, blue shirt there. <laughs> Hi, Mike, <clears throat> excuse me, Mike Miller. Um, I just want to pick up on sort of that conversation and extend it into sort of the broader EHR um, capabilities around clinical decision support, because I think Josephine brought up, you know, the concept of waste. And sure, a repeated test is expensive, but a test that never should have done in the first place mm -hmm. is even more, you know, is price is zero. Uh, and I know... I don't know if it's impolitic of me to say this, but there's another organization around doing this Choosing Wisely campaign, try and educate physicians around all these things that are routinely done that shouldn't be done. Uh, you know, the classic maybe uh, low back pain of three days with maybe a little ridiculous pain, but no red signs. Does that person need any kind of imaging? But it happens all the time. So the price, no matter what the price, it's a waste. Can you guys comment upon that and maybe how you're going to extend some of this price transparency work into the broader clinical decision support? Thank you. I mean, I, I think from um, a lot of that, not a lot of that, but I think partly, again, that, that consumer role is important in some of these things. And I think um, giving people a voice and understanding what they can and can't do and where their decision-making lies. You, I, you know, it's interesting we talk about shared decision making at the point of a diagnosis um, and, and sort of certain conditions lend themselves to that. But I think there's a broader conversation about what shared decision making really is. Um, I, you know, I'll quickly tell another sort of personal story. I, I um, was having some issues a few years ago and got referred to a specialist and was concerned about something that was fairly severe. And, and he said, you know, I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's not this severe thing, it's other, this other thing that's totally manageable in other ways. But <laughs> but let's get to that 0.01%. And he ordered a radiology exam, three blood tests, some other things that were not things that I was all that interested in. And I, having been in this for as long as I have, s sat stunned in his office, took all of my orders, got my appointments, got to my car and said, whoa, what just happened to me? And, and called him. I um, actually called my primary care physician who, who referred me, I threw everything away, canceled all my tests. Um, called my primary care physician and said, I don't, I, I'm good. And he said, well, I'd like you to call the specialist back just so you can have that conversation with him, which I did, which was incredibly painful. Because he said, he said, really? And I said, yeah, you're like 99%. I'm good with 1%. I can take the 1% risk. I own that. And that was my decision to make. But at that point, we weren't talking shared decision. We weren't talking about preference sensitive care. We were talking about how comfortable I was with you being 99% sure. And I own that risk, and, I, and I'm OK with that. And I think you know, that's not an easy thing. And it's a paradigm shift that's not common to folks. And quite honestly, a lot of folks aren't comfortable with 1%. But at the end of the day, if my 1% also ties to the fact that I would have paid $500 out of my deductible, I have to weigh that in. And so, I mean, I, I do think that there's some of that consumer component of the, the wasted pieces that's also, you know, the physicians are doing it because the consumer is saying, I want everything under the sun to have every assurance of that non-diagnosis. David? I was just going to add that I think not only does the individual, as Joe's case describes, have the opportunity to take action, but the employer and the other purchasers can look at the data that's in an all-payer claims database for the patterns of care that you're describing. 
and looking for um, people who are high users of those services is an opportunity to flag them and create a preferred network of some kind with a benefit design or a cost sharing arrangement that says we're not going to encourage you to go to people who are consistently making those kinds of decisions to overuse certain tests. So this database has multiple purposes beyond the individual consumer decision making. And I'll just, I'll just add, I think choosing wisely is an, an excellent effort. I think, you know, it's, it's, at, it's clearly still at its beginnings because, you know, we're watching like, uh, you know, the orthopedics show up uh, and talk about a bunch of things that shouldn't be done. Although there are probably higher revenue items that have even less aggregate value that don't yet find their way onto the list. And so I think we can perhaps even choose more wisely as time goes on. Uh, down in front, if we could bring the microphone. Thank you. I'm John Rother. I'm the president and CEO of the National Coalition on Healthcare. Medicare recently released uh, data on individual physicians and their claims, a uh, vast database. Um, and I wondered if you could comment on um, how useful you think that is and how that compares to what you're advocating in terms of an all-payer claims release. Sure. Um you know, I, I think the, the reality is that in, um, there was some interesting coverage about, you know, high utilizers of services and things that were um, probably interesting discussion starters that came as a result of the release of that data, um, which I think is always good to have those discussions sort of out in the open and, and, and bring the context of healthcare and variation and um, decision making and overuse and all of that into the sort of public um, channels of communication is great. Um, you know, I've I've looked at the tools. I've tried to use them. They're they're interesting for sure. You know, I think if you if you are kind of trying to understand where um, dollars are being spent from a Medicare standpoint and physicians in certain areas, it's really valuable. Um, you know, I think from a price perspective, obviously Medicare has doesn't have the kind of modifications in pricing and negotiations that others do, so the value in that kind of discussion is more limited. Oh, right, uh, David or Joe, a few other. Yeah, I think, I think spotlights can be uncomfortable, but sunshine is an excellent disinfectant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, now also down in front, please. Yeah, this is Paul Ginsberg. I'm one of the report authors. I just wanted to bring up that our discussion hasn't focused too much on the value of price information to audiences besides consumers, such as employers, uh, policymakers. And I think some of the most powerful examples of transparency at work has been with those audiences. You know, the, the study recently about New Hampshire, where the main influence of uh, uh, price transparency in New Hampshire was on major employers who changed their benefit designs re because the typical employer benefit design with a large deductible isn't very effective at steering patients who are going to be hospitalized <coughs> to higher value hospitals. And even though while David's members are very sophisticated, there are many employers around the country that are not. And, and that's a real opportunity in this area. Anybody want to uh, comment on that point? I, I agree strongly. Uh, and I, you know, one of the issues that's not clear is, to most people is that the health plans often bring a network of providers to the employer and say, here's the network of doctors and hospitals your people will have access to, without being able to expose the, individual, the variation among them to the, to the employees. So the moving to where this transparency gives that opportunity uh, would let the benefit designs be more subtle in the way that Paul just described. Uh, we've got some questions up here uh, on the right-hand side. Thank you. Marianne Caprino. Um, you've made a very rational argument for a lot of change, and we know that there are loads of impediments um, to get there. So what would you highlight as your key policy recommendations to get us to a more transparent environment? Well, and for my sector, the employers, uh, the issue, the recommendations in the paper that specifically apply to uh, eliminating gag clauses and increasing the availability of data are very important. And I, I think the employers and others have to go to their legislatures and say, we need this information to be available to drive a healthy health care market um, and be advocates around that. But I also think the meaningful use suggestion is also one that employers and the public should be advocating. Um, yeah, I think, I think we're particularly interested in making sure that um, as, the, as the states move, and we encourage the states to move, 
uh, to create all payer claims databases, that we do so with uh, a toolkit that allows for sufficient federalization over the different state databases. And so that we don't wind up with a fractured set of transparency that by itself winds up obfuscating some of the realities. And so I think we want to make sure, and I think this is something we're going to try to work with Joe on, uh, to make sure that as the states come forward to do this, they do so in a way which is sufficiently structured and sufficiently standardized so that we can reap the reward of this as a country and not just uh, in, in locales. Yeah, and, and I would say, you know, I'm not sure it's a policy recommendation per se, but but one of the things that, that we hear a lot from the states that have all prior claims databases is a, is a real hunger for standardized tools that would allow for consistency in this kind of reporting of the data as well. And um, you know, the, the states um, uh, are sort of strapped for that kind of analytic capacity mostly and, and ways in which that could be leveraged across states. There is a real hunger for that at the state level and it's not, you know, Lack of standardized tools isn't because they're not interested in it, just because the mechanisms for that doesn't it, don't exist. And I think that's a real opportunity. Sure. Hi, I'm Locke Kerr, and I'm um, involved in startup companies. Uh, I wanted to ask about the health savings accounts, which were growing like topsy prior to Obamacare at 50, 70 percent per year, and are now larger than HMOs in terms of their patient. Uh, basis. Uh, they certainly would encourage with their high deductibility and have encouraged price transparency and perhaps is the largest mechanism to encourage price transparency. The legislation with Obamacare took away some of the advantages of health savings accounts and I wonder whether um, we can encourage uh, re-providing some of those advantages to drive price transparency and um, uh, action, taking of action in, in uh, utilizing price transparency. Well, I know we're fortunate to have Roy Ranth Rantham in the audience, who's I think uh, probably one of the nation's leading experts on uh, health savings accounts. And so I wouldn't pretend to say anything <laughs> that Roy wouldn't, wouldn't say. I, you know, all I could do as a preamble would be to say that uh, you know, high deductible health care plans that have been, you know, substantially on the rise and I think now uh, constitute the majority of, of health care plans for relatively small uh, companies, uh, certainly at this point, and are on a, on a tear uh, to be that which we will all will ultimately have. Uh, and those with, with or without HSAs all provide an incentive for uh, a sh more of a shopping behavior and that the only way you can shop is if you know the, the price and the value. But you know, I, I might I might even encourage Roy if you've got a specific comment uh, to come on up and, and say something. Uh, or take a mic. Or take a mic. I know or he's got a bad a mic. leg. Yeah, would that yeah. be fair? Let's, let's, give, be <laughs> let's give Roy a mic. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, HSAs, I think, are are continuing to grow um, even under the new regulatory structure. We don't have yet the. Uh, details of the enrollment uh, in the uh, private ex uh, public exchanges, uh, but certainly on the employer side, the trajectory seems to be increasingly upward in terms of adoption of these types of plans. And I think that's important, e whether or not there's a health savings account uh, attached to it, um, those individuals have the financial incentive to care about the cost, the quality, and the value of the services. So we definitely would like to encourage those trends because that will bring the patients to the table, hopefully as equal partners uh, with the physicians, um, with their health plans, uh, their employer also participating, um, that will drive this change faster than in the absence of those plans. And I think to Paul's point, it needn't be just driving every individual. Um, you will be more interested that your employer finds the right plan and the right networks so that you can stretch those dollars as far as they can go. And so it, it, it both gets you interested in your, in your individual decisions, but also gets you very interested in your employer's decisions, which then empowers your HR person who may not have been so enthusiastic about you know, doing, doing all of the negotiation to do a better job because all the employees are watching. 
I saw two more questions first. Uh, well, there's now more. Uh, but the gentleman in the plaid shirt on the aisle there, I think, would be next. And then uh, we'll work our way around. We've got time for the two others, I think. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Mark Smith, also from the also from the MedStar Institute for Innovation. I'm the director there, although I'm talking in my former capacity as the chair of emergency medicine uh, and responsible for running five emergency departments across MedStar. Uh, I'm struck, I've been struck by the tremendous variation, even with a sing, within a single physician group, of, uh, of utilization of certain, say, diagnostic tests. You know, if we look at, for abdominal pain, how often are we ordering a, a CT scan? You have some, some physicians who are all the way up there at 60%, and others who are down to 20%. And whether it's a knowledge issue or whether it's a, um, uh, a risk, what is your own personal risk aversion or experience in the past, those are all. But I, I do think that, at the very least, we have not in the past made that information to public within our own group. And I'm hoping that there's, we're doing it now, that there's a certain self-organization that will occur that will bring people together. But I do think, I want your comments on it, how we can use, whether we can come up with strategies for this cost transparency and variation uh, among hospital-based groups that we know are all in the same domain uh, for trying to uh, um, get, bring, bring us into a, uh, a happy median. Well, I'll just give you one example. In California, we have a pay for performance program under the Integrated Healthcare Association. And they've started in the last couple of years having a total cost of care metric as part of the formula. So what that does is it gives back to the group uh, both a gross and a more granular estimate of total cost of care. So if their use of diagnostic testing in the emergency room, uh, if, that's, if the group is controlling that, um, is out of bounds, it's influencing their total cost of care, in turn influencing their reimbursement structure as a whole. So it's another case where having the data aggregated, processed, and then fed back, benchmarked against all the community providers triggers that internal analysis you're talking about. But our feeling has been it's important to have an external market pressure to motivate everybody inside the group to look at that data and seek opportunities for efficiency. Okay, uh, in the third row, and then our last question will be uh, the gentleman uh, toward the back. Oh, that was your question, okay. <laughs> Well, gas on. You've got an extra minute or two. Uh, Juan Pablo Segura from a company called One EQ that uses connected devices to improve the quality and decrease the cost of care in prenatal care. Um, so, I, I think the the analogy of a of a team sport was was great. I love that. And um, so, continuing on the sports metaphors. Uh, um, so, who do you think needs to be the quarterback? Um, because it sounds like the consumer will only kind of push for transparency when healthcare costs are the majority of their disposable, not even disposable budget, just their budget, right? So um, right now, who needs to lead? Is it the employer? Is it, uh, is it going, is it gonna be purely symbiotic? It doesn't seem like it's gonna be that way. Um, so I'm just curious your, your thoughts, uh, yeah. Thanks. I bet we get three different answers. Yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> um, so I, I don't think it's football. Um, right. You know, it, it might be more like soccer or rugby, um, where I don't think you, know, you can identify, um, you know, a, a responsible person. I think, I think at some point, it's got to be about the patient. Um, and, and, you know, I could argue that the patient may be the goalkeeper in, in lacrosse, you know? I mean, so, so you, you've got you've to protect yourself from the, the onslaught of, you know, multiple illnesses but uh, oftentimes from those well-intentioned who are trying to help you um, because the knowledge base is, is immature oftentimes and the incentives for everybody aren't all the way clear. Um, and so I, I'm, I, I'm not sure how far we can push the sports analogy. Um, you know, I, I do think that the acquisition of healthcare, the, the attainment of, of healthcare and health is all, is all a team sport, but we lose track of how best to do it if the patient really isn't in the center. I, I, I like the sports metaphor, but at a meta level, I think um, <laughs> the, every sport has rules. And within those rules, the competitors have roles, and they play out those roles toward, a, toward trying to achieve goals in the net, or whatever the, the objective is. We don't have a very good set of rules that say the data is going to be transparent. 
and the tools are going to be available, and people are going to have choices that are meaningful, and they're going to have information on quality and outcomes that they can use. So that that's in the game here, the, the outcome, the goal is to have a healthier society that can afford the healthcare system it needs. And we're not, we don't have the rules in place to do that. So I think the things in the report are a beginning set of putting some of those rules down that we can all agree to and then work within. Yeah, and, and you know, I think going back to the sports analogy, my, my brother-in-law was an offensive lineman and he was always so mad, right, when everyone looked at the quarterback, right? Because he's like, well, without me, what can he do, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah. so I, I think that the, the analogy is everybody has to be a little bit ready, right? Because even if you have the, the consumer, let's say the consumer is the quarterback, they're really ready and the rest of the system can't handle them, then you sort of lose the ability for that person to be effective in their role. And so, I, I mean, I think the, the soccer analogy is actually where I went first, which is everybody on the field has kind of an equal playing role. And, and I think that's true for football, too, because that's what I was taught by the offensive <laughs> linemen in my world. Yeah, well, and if you think about the offensive linemen, you know, the, most, the highest paid one is, is the, you know, playing the blind side. And if we think about healthcare pricing transparency, it's just that blindness that we have to get rid of. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you all for coming and joining us online. David, Joe, and Josephine, it was terrific. Really enjoyed it. Hope you all had as much fun as we did up here. So thanks again, and thanks to Wes for uh, help for making it all happen. Thank you.